lands and our coach for the community, a committee on community and diversity. Um, and I'd like to start this event with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homes of the Stockbridge Mountain Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continue as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more equitable and inclusive space for all. Williams Reads aims to foster new connections among students, staff, faculty, and community members by exploring diversity through a common reading experience. Developed by the Committee on Diversity and Community, Williams Reads is an initiative offered as an opportunity for us to explore a book together that will help us celebrate and deepen our appreciation of diversity. It is the goal of the CDC to select a book that will stimulate community engagement and a challenging conversation. Our book in 2021 to 2022 is Ebony and Ivy by Craig Stephen Wilder. Today, we are holding a panel of historians and alum who have engaged in distinguished work examining how higher education educational institutions have been implicated in the histories of racialized violence. Our panelists today include Tatiana Cruz, Assistant Professor and Interdisciplinary Program Director of Africana Studies at Simmons University, Williams Class of 2009. Aston Gonzalez, Assistant Professor of History at Salisbury University, Williams Class of 2008. And Delicia Jolly, Postdoctoral Fellow and Incoming Assistant Professor of Black Studies at Amherst College, Class of 2014. Many of our panelists' work are available for sale at our Williams Bookstore on Spring Street. Had there to see a great display on books that examines institutional histories in higher education. Also, please go check out the Williams Reed exhibit Spaces, Places, and Names in Special Collections. The exhibit is also a pop up both in Scow and Sawyer by the new releases. Our moderator today is Siobhan Robinson, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Williams and an alum. I will turn things over to her now. Thank you, Essence, for that introduction. I also uh, want to thank the other members of the uh, Committee on Community and Diversity who have put so much work into the programming that's been going on this week. So in particular, the historian panel yesterday and the alumni panel today. So um, we uh, have a few questions planned today for our panel. Um, that we'll start off with and then we'll leave some time at the end for any questions from the audience. Feel free to post your question right into the chat. That will be monitored. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the conversation. You could put them in uh, as they come up. And I also just wanted to remind everyone that this is being recorded, so take that into consideration. Um, so as Essence mentioned, our uh, Williams Reed book for this year is Ebony and Ivy by uh, Craig Wilder, which really takes a deep dive into the intertwined histories of slavery, racism, and higher education in America. Um, and for our panel today, I kind of wanted to start off with reflecting on experiences as Williams students, um, in particular for our panelists, to consider you know, what type of resources were available for you during your academic journey at Williams? How did they help you navigate um, that experience? And then maybe what were some resources that were missing that you wished were here and perhaps could be implemented in the future to help students um, succeed uh, in this space? So anyone can jump in. I can kick it off. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's always hard when you're on a virtual panel to be polite. And, you know, um, so I think when I think back to my time at Williams, which to which I spent a long time at Williams, longer than other students, um, I would say the best resources I had were faculty, um, faculty mentors. And it's certainly, you know, what I recommend when I work with students now who think about you know, um, where to go to college or where to go to grad school. I would say the faculty mentors I had were probably the 
best resources, um, as well as what used to be called OSAP, but I think it's called Pathways for Inclusive Excellence now. Um, I, hi, Clinton. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think um, had I not been involved in the Mellon program, I wouldn't be a professor today. Um, so for me, that was probably the best resource, as well as financial aid, I, you know, as a low income student, financial aid was everything and it got better over my time here. Um, we went from uh, standing in line in the 1914 library, which folks probably don't know what that is, but very dated system to, uh, you know, getting to keep our books uh, as financial aid students. So that was huge. Um, in terms of what I wish, wish I had, um, I felt that actually the, the OSAP office or the Pathways for Inclusive Excellence was, was really um, exclusive. Um, I thought, you know, my partner was also a Williams student and had no idea that any of those resources were available as did many of my peers. Um, I also wish that there were opportunities to have better advising um, and mentorship. And I think hopefully some of those things have changed in the many years since I've been gone. But as a first gen student, I wasn't part of anything for first gen students. I had no mentorship as a, as a student of color. Um, and I, I wish that I had had all of those things so I could have accessed the parts of Williams that I felt my white students, uh, peers knew about. Um, so I didn't know about the internships that people were getting. I was like, where does everybody get all these internships? And where, you know, there were so many things that I felt people knew that I had no idea because I literally had no idea what I was doing in college. Um, so had I been in any programming designed for first gen students or students of color in particular, as well as had advising from the jump from the day I walked in, um, I think I would have been more successful in my first year. I'm happy to jump on in. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, to have dialogue, um, to return in to Williams, even if it's only virtually for right now. Um, in terms of the available resources that were most helpful for me, it was mentorship and models, right? Having access to invested mentors and exposure to um, models. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So one, having like invested mentors that help you like navigate what often felt like in an unfamiliar terrain, especially for me as a first gen student, I, coming from public school in Brooklyn, I really learned about the programs and fellowships such as Mel MMUF, as um, Dr. Cruz mentioned, Gaudino, Fulbright, in my conversations with professors during office hours or just walking along campus from offices. Um, I appreciated the resources of offices, such as the Pathways for Inclusive Excellence, which was OSAP during my time, and from staff and administrators also who have vast institutional knowledge and thought that, you know, I might be interested in learning um, how to navigate the space and demystifying it. Uh, I would say my professors in women's gender sexuality studies and black studies were especially helpful and allowed me to see what the day to day work of studying, researching and writing looked like, um, but also what other pathways, pathways there were, such as like scholar activism, community engaged work, movement building and practice, which was just as important for me as the intellectual um, context, which is often bifurcated, but um, it's more of a spectrum for me. Um, I would also note that like navigating my Williams journey academically was very linked to my development of just like a critical lens to the world and my place in it and my professors were crucial to that but also were there also were um, students who were in my class here and beyond so I overlapped with Dr. Cruz and getting that exposure was literally like intellectual work scholar activism and practice at the time. Um, Tati led a woman of color feminist organization that like did radical anti-racist feminist work. And seeing that as a first year was big for me, just seeing the intergenerational forms of movement building, but also seeing how people literally were taking the things they were learning in their world and their place in, in the classrooms and their place in the world and really sharing that knowledge, but also building community and applying it in practice. So that was critical. Um, Williams is isolated, but community building and people power are important for such an intimate space. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think that's that's one of the main things. One of the things I would think uh, that I would sort of wish I had or wish existed during the time and now is the expanding resources of OSAP, sorry, the PI office, um, uh, and applying that to broader students, right? That who 
um, weren't necessarily in Mellon. Um, and also I would say more direct engagements with alumni of color, black alumni, understanding the pathways that they took, understanding the strategies of building um, uh, community, but also institutional transformation that they took was great. I think we had that for early, like the first year of my um, time at Williams and it's like slowly dwindled across the years. Um, so I wasn't sure what, why that was the case, but that's what I would have wanted to see. So I just wanted to echo the thanks um, that other folks had mentioned already. Um, for those who are creating this uh, a wonderful space for us to speak, um, Clinton, Thank you very much. And also Siobhan and Essence for you know, making everything possible today. But I really wanted to, to echo, um, as I knew OSAP's importance in my life, because you know one of the reasons that I went to Williams uh, was because it was so far away from home. I actually wanted to experience something totally different. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And um, it was very difficult the first year to find my people, to find, um, the institutions that I knew, or the, the part of the institution, parts of the institution that I knew would be helpful for me. I didn't know anything about the resources that were available on campus. I mean, a lot of things that Dr. Cruz mentioned about, you know, internships. You know, I remember my the first um, summer after my my first year at Williams, just thinking about how do I get a job? Like, I didn't know anything about this. Whereas other people had internships lined up. You know, just a few months after starting at Williams, it was very uh, foreign to me. And so I remember it was a very difficult summer for a lot of reasons, but um, I just wanted to say that the some of the resources that were extremely helpful for me, especially those first few years of Williams were OSAP and also, you know, the same, the same building where uh, OSAP was housed also was the home of Avista and, and QSU and those resources, especially QSU for me, um, was really, uh, they were just fantastic because you know, I was leaving Texas, really hoping for a, a less politically conservative place. And um, the QSU and its peoples there were, were amazing. So I, I really was involved with QSU um, for a very long time. And that was really helpful for me because I was able to learn um, the connections that students could make with faculty members as we did on the Dively Committee. That was really important for me and to learn how students and faculty could work together. Um, and also to be treated as a peer in a lot of ways by serving on the Dively Committee, that was amazing. But I learned too about, you know, a summer, um, summer funding that was available. So it's those kinds of doors that opened that led to more doors and more doors and more doors that um, I'm really thankful for and that really helped me navigate my time at Williams, I think, well, um, once I sort of got the hang of it. But I think too, one of the things that was really helpful for me was to have, or to know that faculty could be mentors. So um, I was one of these students who was not, um, who was very cautious about office hours, I'll say that at the beginning, I didn't know what they were, right? And I actually en encountered that quite a lot with my students now as a professor who who have no idea what office hours are. And I tell them, no, it's not to, to come here uh, and when you're in trouble, there, that, that's not it at all, but rather this is an opportunity to talk about um, the course, about life, about uh, the connections that you're making between the two things, right? Courses that you're taking in life um, more broadly. And so, you know, I really got to get a, give a shout out to um, Charles Dew and also Gretchen Long, who were the faculty mentors that really guided me, especially in my, my sophomore, junior and senior years and um, there was also a professor Monroe, Brenna Monroe, who's now actually teaching in Florida right now, who was a, um, a mentor for an independent study, uh, a winter study that I, that I created with another student. So, you know, those kinds of opportunities were wonderful, but I really wish that um, there were resources and people in communities that I knew about off campus. I mean, I know, you know, all of us here know that the purple bubble is real. And there's so much more off campus than we could even possibly imagine when we're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you know? So I think making those connections more broadly, you know, in a geographic sense would be really helpful, but also from a personal and professional standpoint, I think it's the, all these things are kind of inter, interwoven and really make us the people that we are. So being able to know what life was like 
off of campus. And I know some of that is my own responsibility, right? Not going off campus more often. Um, but I, I think that was one thing that I would highly recommend to, um, to students now and also to those involved at the college. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing those experiences. So one common thread that I, that I see between the three of you is this idea of the importance of mentorship and community. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for William students, particularly those who are underrepresented or from marginalized communities who might be struggling with finding those type of connections. Um, how, you know, kind of what's the first step to establishing a, a mentor relationship or uh, establishing trust with a, a space or a community so you can kind of get that guidance? I would just say, um, take classes, um, take all the classes with the people you like. <laughs> I think I became a history and American studies majors and, and Africana Latinx studies uh, minors because I just found faculty that I vibed with and took them for every single class. Um, I took all their classes. I followed my favorite professors. And um, I think for me, I forged relationships first by class, I was not an office hours person at all. Um, but I think um, having repeat professors that I got increasingly more comfortable with made a huge difference. Um, and then obviously having a more formal mentorship through some of those um, research programs was really helpful. Um, but I would say particularly for marginalized students, like first of all, ask all the questions, um, really ask all the questions. I was, I was really grateful to have, um, some amazing professors and, and since Dr. Gonzalez shouted out folks, I'm gonna to have to shout out folks. Um, but I think um, Dr. Leslie Brown, um, who has since passed, as well as um, Carmen Whelan and um, Maria Elena Cepeda and uh, Maria Rua, who's no longer there. Like these folks were great to answer questions that were, I thought were embarrassing and dumb. Like, what do I wear to a conference? Um, you know, what do they expect from this interview and, you know, how do I represent myself? So I think, um, I took a lot of classes to feel more comfortable and then start to kind of bridge that gap between, okay, I'm just like one of your students to I'm like one of your students, if you know what I mean? Like one of yours. Um, so for me, that was that. And I think also if you're a marginalized student, I would say advocate for yourself, um, and that can be really, really hard. Um, but if you need something, um, if the if the universe or if the college is not providing you with something that would help you, um, you really need to advocate for yourself because Williams has money. Like there's, you're in a in a very privileged space that has all the resources available to you. So if there's something you need that can help you um, become a better version of yourself and a better student, advocate for it. Um, for me, it was advocating for. Uh, additional financial aid, um, advocating for off-campus resources, which were not provided. And there were, I mean, I was thinking about what Dr. Gonzalez said, wanting to leave the purple bubble. Well, in some instances you have to leave. And for me, I couldn't live on campus because I had a child at Williams and um, there were no resources for me in place. And so I advocated to get them. And I think that that, um, was something that I'm proud of and also was really difficult. And I think um, students should continue to advocate for themselves, particularly if they are non-traditional students or fall within out with um, outside of the realms of kind of what a what a typical Williams student looks like. I was also going to say um, that it really helped me to look widely to find my people. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, I, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Cruz has said. And I think too, it's important to challenge yourself and ourselves um, to go to, to groups and organizations that, uh, you know, that are hosting meetings, you know, MINCO meetings that might be outside of your own identity. I mean, there's so much uh, wealth available at Williams in many senses. Um, but that, you know, in the context of this conversation is really important for, you know, stretching yourself and, and who you think you are and, you know, making sure that you have exposure to different people and experiences, um, if not your own, vicariously through other people, but to learn from those other people's experiences. 
And I think, you know, going to, to organizations and groups just to, to meet new people and to see um, what they're all about, I think is a really important way of, of challenging yourself. I mean, I came from San Antonio, Texas. You know, I don't recall ever having met a Jewish person before getting to, um, to Williams. And, you know, wow, that story has changed um, quite a lot. But my, like, my point though is that, you know, there's just so much, uh, there's such a spectrum of, of experience and life that um, we don't have as an, 18, as an undergraduate, I should say. And, um, right, just looking broadly to see who you connect with and also to, to think about professors as part of those individuals, right? Going up to them after class, during class even, right? Asking these questions. And you know they will they will share stories with you. They will um, they will become your advocates and your allies and your mentors if if you're putting in the work and they see that and you all have a common purpose or mission. So I really think uh, looking broadly is important and to think of college um, that college experience of yours as an opportunity to do those things. I just want to briefly echo absolutely looking widely and looking broadly to who you connect with. Um, and the best way for me that was really easy to connect with people was just over food um, when I would be to feel, you know, just kind of afraid of going up to professors and making connections. Um, I think I would just like invite out to lunch um, one of the professors I was taking a class with. I don't know if it's still there, but there was a little fund for um, just for that, just for like having lunch with professors, lunch or dinner with professors. Um, and so that was a way to kind of uh, sort of smooth out uh, the fare that I had. Um, in addition to taking classes, I think one of the things I was always interested in just knowing about their work and lives outside of the classes that they teach. And so Googling them in the you know ele most elementary way of finding out about someone, but Googling them and really trying to figure out, okay, well, what, what kind of work do they do? You know, what is it like being a professor? And what is a professor beyond, um, you know, coming and teaching class, sharing your syllabus? And I remember one of the professors, um, Neil Roberts, who is also uh, an a MLN alum, asked me one day after an event, um, he, in, at the 62 Center, he asked me, Oh, do you do you you know have you have a desire to be a professor? Do you is that something that you want to do? And I remember thinking, well, I don't really know what that is, but I know you're one. Um, and knowing you demystifies that for me. But sure, you can tell me a little bit more about this process. And others such as Ron Medical Bryant, Molly, um, uh, you know, had, at different points kind of shared a similar message. And I think that for me was another way to sort of build connection and really learning about their pathways, demystifying that for myself and figuring out if that's something that I wanted to emphasize, um, if I, that, that I wanted to pursue. Um, I, beyond the sort of, you know, mentor connections with professors, I also wanted to mention another piece of mentorship for me, which is the intergenerational community building piece that happens like um, horizontally among your peers. Like, I think that was so important um, seeing Dr. Cruz advocate for herself at the financial aid office showed me that I can advocate for myself at the financial aid office. So I remember like being in there, I don't know if the, the, per, this is the same people, but I remember just having lengthy conversations um, about how to navigate this and how to do it. And I remember, oh, I can advocate for this because I know it's possible. I've seen it done in, in different you know situations, even if it was just a few, I knew it was possible. So I think um, you, you might not always know what to ask if you don't know. You, I think there's a saying like, you don't know what you don't know. So just witnessing that or having exposure to people who've navigated this in a different was really helpful. Having lunch with, you know, someone in, the, in two years um, above me who, um, who pursued like the Fulbright or who had, you know, opportunities or, um, or who did the melon or who did, decided to go abroad or who decided not to was just another way for me to kind of figure out how can I make those decisions for myself in a way that's tailored to my investments, my priorities, and my um, own desires? So I think the intergenerational community building piece is um, was really important. Building across as we were building up, um, developing connections with professors and trying to demystify um, how that's done, um, so that I can go to office hours, so that I can you know ask these larger questions about the pathways. And really quick to, to sort of jump off on something that Dr. Jolly said um, about attending an event um, 
that that's one thing too, right? Show up to the events that you're really interested in and you will find other people who are interested in similar topics, right? So go to those anti-racist events, go to those um, talks and lectures and musical performances, musical performances even, um, and you will find people, you will find your people, right? So that's all I wanted to say. Can I add one thing too? Sorry. Um, I, I just think that, um, like we talk a lot about finding mentors, but sometimes what turns you off is you try and it doesn't work out. And, and I think that um, now that I'm on the other end, it's really important for me to think about like resilience and, and how, how do you train students to overcome those difficult moments and those adversities. And so for me, my, my first time around at Williams, I had a very difficult time connecting with some of my faculty and, and I didn't feel like I had anyone in my corner. I didn't feel like I had faculty, staff, uh, deans. I didn't feel like anyone cared if I was there or left. Um, and I think it was really hard, um, even when I kind of left school and then came back, for me, it was really hard um, dealing with some faculty who made me feel like I didn't belong. And, and there were many instances, and I know that this is supposed to be positive, a positive panel, but I think that we can't talk about kind of the traumas that many of us faced at Williams, particularly as students of color. Um, so for me, um, having gone through experiences where faculty said, you're, you're not good enough to write a senior thesis. You're not good enough to go to graduate school. Um, and me like crying and leaving their office, like I guess I'm the worst and forget about this, right? Um, those were kind of defining moments in my career where I could have just walked away and said, this isn't for me. But instead I funneled all that energy into the people who did see something in me. And I found other mentors and I was like, maybe I'm not going to be claimed by the history department. That's okay. I'm a history major. The history department doesn't like me. That's okay. I'm going to go hang out in Africana studies. Um, did I get a history PhD from a top program? I did, but don't worry because they didn't believe in me and that's okay, right? Um, and so I think that sometimes uh, we need to talk about um, finding your people sometimes means feeling rejection, um, sometimes means feeling like it doesn't vibe, like that professor's personality doesn't work with you, right? Um, and that's okay. And there are other people. <laughs> there are other people. And sometimes you'll get mentorship in all different places. And um, for me, like Molly McGavern was everything. And she was not faculty. And she was a white woman. And, and I was surprising to me who was constantly looking for faculty who looked like me. Um, but sometimes you'll find mentorship in unusual places. Um, and people will connect with you in different ways. So I just want to encourage students to feel like if that first time you go to office hours and you're like, ooh, this professor, we're just not it, that's okay. There are so many other people. Um, There's so many other people. Thank you so much for, for making that point. Um, and just the idea that you can have mentors for different aspects and components of your career as well too, I think is really, uh, something to keep in mind. So um, I wanted to transition a little into kind of thinking about your courses and, and you know, the material that you experienced as an undergrad um, in relation to the requirement that Williams currently has. It's gone through a few different iterations, but right now it's called uh, Differences, Power and Equity, DPE. Um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on whether you feel that the requirement of just one DPE course is enough to really reckon with, with these issues um, and whether uh, the college should be encouraging more active thought and participation in these, in these issues relating to social justice. I think one of the, the things that I've noticed since graduating in 2008 is that the student body seems to be even more involved in social activism. And I don't know if that's just because of it's a, the, the college's universe, um, social media presence or, or, or what, I don't know, how, you know, that's obviously being filtered in, in different ways to me. Um, but one thing that I, I mean, obviously I think that the, the current DPE one course requirement is, is not enough. But um, I think that the college can really encourage students to be um, more active in social justice campaigns 
by encouraging stronger connections to the community, the outside community, right? I think the areas around the college um, are incredibly rich places. And I think about this not in a, in a unidirectional kind of relationship, but rather there are things that both the university can offer to the surrounding communities and, the, and vice versa, right? Um, but I think, I mean, that's a given and I think that's something that everybody knows. But I think one way that the university could really change things, or the, the college, sorry, I'm used to speaking about my university, um, that the college can change things is to admit more students that have demonstrated experience with social justice work um, so that they can strengthen a, a culture on campus that really recognizes and advances um, so, social justice campaigns. So, I mean, I think the students, as far as I can tell, from social media are really interested and passionate on the whole, or at least compared to um, when I was a student, um, many different topics. But I think that you know, admissions can do a little bit more work here um, if we're thinking about roles that the, that the college itself can do as an institution. Because I think the, the interest certainly and uh, the passion is there among students. It's just what kinds of ways that the institution can actually advocate and, and support and strengthen that. I think, you know, having students on campus who have a demonstrated commitment to these, to these topics uh, from the get-go um, would be great, but also that those topics and that kind of community and that coalition building is something that really spreads um, quickly when you have students who already have done the work, they've they can train other people um, and they can really sort of make those broader calls for change in the curriculum, et cetera, so. I would say that I don't think that requirement's enough. I mean, it's more than what I had. I had none requirements. So like moving forward, a little progress. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of debate about making things required and what it means to be mandatory and have mandatory trainings and mandatory things. Um, for me, I feel like it, it was always a strange experience that my Williams experience was all race and ethnic studies and that you can graduate from Williams and have no race and ethnic studies. Um, and so I often felt there were alumni who I met who I was like, well, if you didn't take these kinds of classes, we never probably saw each other. Um, and so I think um, it could be more integrated um, beyond just required classes. I mean, I do think like first year courses would be great. Um, I, I'm all about required first year courses. I think it's, um, we have that at my institution, but I think it's a really great community building experience um, to have courses just for first year students um, and perhaps like a sequence or a required sequence or something. Um, but I also think that, um, like the entry system and JA system, there's like a great opportunity there to create more intellectual communities. Um, I didn't hang out in my entry ever and I, I didn't feel connected to my entry or my JA so much, um, who are great people. It just, it, it just didn't make sense for me and I found community elsewhere. But, um, but if there was you know, a required book and we're all having a book club about this sort of race thing, I think I might've been drawn more um, I think that my interests didn't align with many of the interests of the people that I was required to live with at the beginning. Um, and then I think over time, you know, people start selecting where they live to represent their peoples, right? Um, they live with people. Um, we used to have like entire black houses on campus. Um, I don't know if they still allow that, <laughs> but I think, um, I think for me, I think those kinds of issues need to be discussed in all classes. And I would challenge my, um, my faculty colleagues at Williams to think about the ways in which they're um, using race and ethnic studies pedagogies even in their math curriculum and in their science curriculum, right? It's not just about teaching black things, right? <laughs> it's about how you teach things. It's about more equitable practices. So for me, when I had a professor do a very inappropriate example in statistics, uh, making fun of pregnant women, and I was a pregnant woman, I felt you know, personally attacked and targeted and victimized. And I was like, wow, that person should get racial sensitivity training and all kinds of trainings, right? Um, so I think, you know, these issues are not, shouldn't be reserved for those in race and ethnic studies. They shouldn't be reserved for Africana studies and such. They should uh, penetrate the entire uh, college 
Um, and really there should be some sort of shared um, thinking about how faculty are teaching and engaging with marginalized populations and their histories. I want to echo everything that was just shared um, in terms of expanding, you know, who the kind of students that Williams enters into, the, um, you know, give space uh, at the college and, and, and that the kind of students they recruit and accept and also definitely expanding um, the kind of sort of race ethnic studies pedagogies that are taught in classes beyond sort of traditional humanities, but also in sciences and across the social sciences. So definitely want to echo that. To respond to the question, absolutely not. <laughs> a DPE requirement is not enough. Um, certainly it is more, as Dr. Cruz mentioned, than what I you know, had at the time. Um, but progress is relative. And one class might facilitate initial awareness, but it absolutely won't facilitate institutional change or structural change. It won't make traditionally privileged students um, or faculty, staff, anyone in the, in the Williams College community evaluate their own privilege biases um, and take concrete steps. And it won't achieve ra um, structural racism, right? So, and, and an elimination of that. So I think in terms of like what is like what kind, what does the college want in terms of active thought and participation? I think that's a question I would ask its, its leadership. That's a question that I would ask the people that carry on its mission. That's a question that I would ask the people who are in the day-to-day -day work of it, of the space, right? Um, we're having this really important conversation. Um, and I, you know, I think I would be curious to know what the what, how much amount of the leadership was engaged in this, right? Beyond just the the, the offices that are typically um, assigned roles around diversity, equity, inclusion, right? And so I think it's integrating all of this definitely in the departments, but also in the wider um, spaces on campus, the center is its leadership, right? Because so much of institutional culture is not just intangible thing, right? It's actually, con it's concrete action done, developed, sustained, or not followed up by individual people. And so when I think about that, I'm thinking about, well, if Williams's mission is to facilitate is is to encounter difference, right? And then to be the college strives to be a responsible citizen and inculcate that in their students. What exactly is the kind of culture that's cultivating it? We know that can't just simply be done with a requirement. We know that it can't just simply be done in, in the classroom. What is the other sort of areas of the space that are doing that? And so I guess my question to that question is who's who shoulders that responsibility? And is there buying from the leadership and the other members and participants of this community beyond people of color and marginalized, traditionally marginalized groups? So, yeah, I mean, jumping up, or before I continue, did uh, Dr. Gonzalez or Dr. Cruz, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, jumping off of, of these themes, um, We've also been thinking, you know, and tying into to Ebony and Ivy, um, you know, how how do we go about reckoning with the historical legacies of elite institutions, you know, especially like Williams, um, and how can that process move us towards a more equitable experience um, on campus, but in just in general in society. You know, um, talking about cultivating that culture of of having students who who want to engage with that material, and it's not just a requirement. Um, how do we apply that to again thinking about that intertwined history of racism and slavery, and how it's built into the foundation of institutions like Williams? I have a lot to say about this topic. I will keep it brief, um, but I'm a historian. So one of the things that I think is really important is knowing your institutional history. And I think it's really important for students to know the history of Williams, like from the jump, right when you come in, should be put all over the website and such, which I'm sure is not a marketing tool. But for me, um, I remember when I was looking at colleges, I um, looked at Brown and Brown had kind of paved the way in um, a slave and land study, right? Their, their connection with slavery and, and the land. And um, I was very impressed, um, even as a high school senior who knew nothing about what I was gonna do in my future, I you know, was compelled by that kind of um, transparency and um, their ability to name who had contributed to the success and um, uh, of the university. And so I think beginning um, 
with understanding how institutions were built off slave labor and, and settler colonialism off the bodies and backs of black and brown people is the, is the number one thing. Um, I saw in the chat, Alison Hight uh, Hightower said, um, was talking about the local indigenous populations and um, the fact that Ephraim Williams owned five slaves. Um, I, I wish that students were fully aware of that as well as all faculty and, and staff. And I wish that there was efforts to uh, really for reparations. So I come from a place that's not DEI. I come from a place of reparative justice. And for me, um, the beginning of reparative justice is owning up to the harm that's been done, acknowledging it, and then figuring out concrete ways to uplift and, and nourish those marginalized populations that you harmed. Um, and so, you know, we can talk for days about land, uh, about land acknowledgements, but that's empty if there's not going to be reparations, right? Um, if the university has an official land acknowledgement that everyone uses, great. Was that done in consultation with the indigenous populations? Was that created as a community effort? And was it done with some action, right? What percentage of the university's profits are going to support indigenous communities? What per, how many slots will they guarantee for indigenous peoples, right? These are actionable things. I mean, I think Georgetown is paving the way. They're providing free tuition for anyone who's a descendant of an enslaved person that Georgetown University was built on. That is phenomenal, right? Um, I think Williams has a, a very large endowment and could do more in paving the way. I remember in my history courses, um, I had one faculty member who I absolutely adored, um, Professor Scott Wong, and he was the only person who ever talked about the Mohawk Trail and what did it mean to have all of these like faux shops that were no, not run by indigenous people. But, and it was phenomenal. And I was like, no one talks about this. Like, how do I learn about this? Like, why is there, why are they not teaching local history? And, and why am I not engaged? And um, for me, I ended up doing um, a project in Dr. Leslie Brown's class. And I looked at the Williamstown archives to kind of uncover the experiences of um, black people throughout, um, you know, a whole, a long period, but um, it, it's really like only if you show interest and I think it should start from a place that we should all be interested, we should all be invested and the, the college itself has to really invest in it and make sure that it's a part of everyone's experience and no one will walk out of Williams College without knowing that their privilege, that what they experience, their legacy and success is directly tied to white supremacy, right? And I will claim that I'm a low income person, I'm a Latina woman, I'm an immigrant and uh, from an immigrant family, my family has no ties to slavery and I benefit from white supremacy and from this legacy because I attended this institution and this institution has given me cultural capital and power, particularly in academia, right? So every time I say Williams College, I should acknowledge that my privilege was earned off of all of these things. And we're all, we're all, you know, we're all responsible for this, right? And so we all have to do the, do the work, right? All do the work of reparative justice, of speaking openly about this, and, and really of making this more about action and less about talk, right? Um, instead of saying, oh, we really appreciate, you know, this land. Okay, wonderful. What are you doing for indigenous communities in, in, in the Purple Valley, right? What are we actually doing? Oof. That's that's right. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Cruz. That was beautifully said. Um, and I fully agree with everything that you said. I think, too, one thing, and instead of re reiterating much of it, um, um, I want to sort of press the college to think about tangible, actionable, reparative justice. And I know that places like Georgetown are few and far between, right? Think about Harvard and Princeton and so many, Columbia, right? A number of these earlier, um, these colleges and universities that were founded during the time of slavery in the United States, of which there are many, many of them, right? Um, they're, these are uncommon actions, the ones that Georgetown is taking. Um, Brown is also, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Cruz, there at the forefront and has been for a very long time. 
Um, but I think one thing that might be specific to, to Williams is to think about um, its, its history of slavery. And one thing that somebody mentioned uh, in, the, in the comments was the enslaved people that, that Colonel uh, Williams um, owned as, as Dr. Cruz mentioned as well. And I think one thing that can, the college can do actually is to think about how um, slavery and, and to act on how slavery has, was you know, provided some of that initial seed money, that $11,000 roughly, or I think it was pounds at the time, um, that was left to the university. And to think about the, the effects of that, right? If we think too about uh, even, even more recently, the ways that the, the college um, denied admission to women and to many other um, groups of people, right? We can think about how that, um, those actions have very, very long effects. And even if the college is not willing to, to say, oh, here's a pot of money set aside for um, the, the descendants of enslaved people from Colonel Williams's estate or um, right, the native peoples whose land um, uh, the college currently occupies and has benefited immensely for more than 200 years, right? We can think about how those, um, those histories sort of are, they branch out, right? We can think about the ways that they exist currently in, um, in our society. Think about reproductive, uh, women's reproductive issues today, the, the slew of laws that have been passed in the past several decades, limiting women's reproductive choices or trying to minimize them as best um, conservatives can, right? To think about how voting rights right now is under attack in this country, right? There are ways that the university can think about the ties between African-American history, women's history, indigenous history in the very present that we live in and try to, you know, even if they don't wanna to set aside a, a block of money, um, which colleges are usually very remiss to do for, or, a, you know, set aside a number of slots at, at the admissions, um, house for indigenous people or for uh, people of African descent, right? There are other tangible ways to, to right the wrongs, at least in a small way, not completely, but right to do that work of reparative justice um, that, that the college can engage in. Um, I just wanna briefly mention this and say one thank you co-panelists for everything you say, also echo and share. Um, and appreciating the reparative approach to thinking about more action and less talk in reckoning with these legacies. I think when the recent reports by Brown and a few other spaces who sort of are, are trying to find ways to build their institution's capacity to reckon with, you know, systemic racism, enslavement, um, extermination of indigenous um, people, they mentioned a few things that I think would be helpful for Williams to acknowledge, embrace, perhaps implement, definitely implement. And four of those um, were like things that you shouldn't do when you are trying to reckon with this history. One of those include institution control narratives, right? That have a subtle preference for institutional voice, right? Who gets to write the story, right? Whether that be historical narrative, whether that be a sort of contemporary story of how, how to uh, move this forward. How do you engage descendants as partner, like as partners, but also um, communities as you know partners and advisors in this process when you're trying to like create a narrative? The second thing is like focusing not on the sort of institution's prowess, right? But focusing really on humanizing so much of the the sort of people who are in bondage to this, right? Like, what do you? How do you prioritize these stories and their perspectives, right? So not just focusing on slaveholding families and not descendants. I think another sort of practice that was mentioned was kind of like telling the stories of people who, you know, who, who, those who lived to tell, those who didn't, but really emphasizing the truthfulness and authenticity to convey the powerful message of, you know, of, of what happened, right? I think a lot of the times, for example, you can think about, and I can think about in the context of Williams College's, you know, celebration of its 200th year of its alumni fund, or um, its alumni uh, group are thinking about Amherst's bicentennial. There's a lot of celebration of look how far we've come, look at the progress, look at the black and brown students on the diversity photos, and look at the, you know, five, four percent black woman faculty that we have. Um, how much of those are retained, who knows? Um, and so when you think about these kind of who writes the narrative and who are we celebrating, what is to what end and who, who is it making look good? 
I think we have to be honest about the kind of narratives that we're, we're, that we're mentioning. And one of the other practice that was mentioned in this report is just the lack of structural parity, right? And again, it goes back to that initial comment that I mentioned is, you, it can't depend on one department you, or two or three in a, a huge institution. It has to be an institution-wide commitment and it has to have a culture of accountability, right? Um, and that is rooted in a fearless storytelling that is rooted in anti-racism and equity in action, right? From anywhere in communication materials to programs to outreach to partnerships. So, so for example, in a Williams College context, you have you know, the predominantly white woman office of the alumni fund that I'm sure is doing foundational work, but what does it mean to engage um, communities of color, alumni of color? What does it mean to engage in meaningful ways um, beyond just sort of a transactional way, right? The, um, it's communities, right? And what kind of campaigns can you develop that actually meaningful, meaningfully address this question of equity, right? Um, I think these are the concrete things that we can think about. We can, you know, the way in which we collect money, the way in which we um, engage um, surrounding communities and populations. I think that's just like one of the examples um, in places to start in, in, in a different way. And I also wanna mention that the wonderful examples that we have by Georgetown, um, as was mentioned in terms of offering like, you know, tuition free um, to fund a scholarship fund for descendants. Um, and, and Brown, which is, you know, pledging restitution for historical ties by establishing a $10 million endowment to support educational initi initiatives in local public high schools, right? Um, some people critique this as insufficient given that only 17% of the local K-12 students are African-American, meaning much of the endowment may end up benefiting students whose families were never enslaved. So we, you know, we, we have like different pros and cons to different proposals, but I think the fact that we're having this conversation about reparative work and reparations in action and concrete sort of initiatives that change the material circumstances and conditions of people um, is important. And, and I think that's the kind of conversation that I actually don't really see in action at Williams and I'm interested and I hope we can build a call maybe in this conversation, at the end of this conversation, reclaiming Williams, but have a direct call to action because I'm tired of conversations that don't, are not accompanied with sustained action. So that's what I'll say on that comment. Yeah, and one very quick um, thing related to what you were saying. Um, I actually don't know some of the things the college has done, to be honest, it's been a while, um, but if the college has not you know, done a complete community um, engaged project on uncovering the ties to slavery, um, then it should, right? I mean, and everything to me starts with the community. I'm part of um, something here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I'm called the Slave Legacy Coalition. And um, it's founded by a descendant of an enslaved person to which all the houses around here and the street names are named after this person's family. Um, and it's a collaboration with Radcliffe and Harvard, a collaboration with um, local history organizations of which I'm on a board, you know, History Cambridge, the Historical Cambridge uh, Commission, right, um, as well as people who, you know, are descendants and people who care deeply about their family name and don't want their name removed from things, even if it appeases some white liberals who are very enthusiastic to remove names from things. Um, but I think everything should be happening in, in a community-based environment. And if, if Williams is not already doing that, which I would hope that it's done a lot already, um, then that, that should be great. And it'd be a great opportunity for students to conduct research too. Very, very quickly too, because I know we have other, uh, more questions uh, at the end, but something that um, Dr. Jolly said made me think about the, the um, report that the Committee on Diversity um, and Community wrote up in its uh, in, in this year's report that has to do with um, not just the successes of Williams in terms of um, right that, that we put on our website that the college puts on its website um, like the Bolin Fellowship for example and and really thinking about how you know uh, guys Charles Bolin was the first black graduate in 1889 like this is this is very important don't get me wrong but it also kind of obscures the histories of how people of African descent um, were denied entrance to the college. And this is, makes the report mentions this woman, Lucy, um, Lucy Terry Prince, who really advocated on her son's behalf to be admitted to the college um, somewhere around the turn of the, the 18th century, um, or sorry, the 19th century. And 
you know, this, these are the histories that we need to know also, right? And that can be part of this reparative justice work that, that the college can undertake because it's, much easier, I think, to sort of push those histories aside if you don't have names and histories to, to uh, and sort of tangible histories to, um, to sort of uh, grasp onto and say, these are the direct effects of racism um, on campus during the, um, the, the founding years of the college. And that continues, right? And think about how many other black students, I'm sure, try to apply for admission to the college until um, Boland was the first to graduate in 1889, right? So that's almost 100 years. So um, that's what's one tangible approach, I think, that also addresses Alison Hightower's question about um, Black people and specifically enslaved people that uh, is in the comments. So, Thank you so much for this, this conversation. I think you guys have hit on some really important points and uh, definitely this idea of moving past just the conversation and actually trying to um, turn that into action, I think is really important. Um, and because it's been so fascinating, I went past the time to leave for audience questions, but so I appreciate you guys incorporating some of the comments in there. Jessica, did you have, uh, I think we might have time for one quick question if there's one that hasn't been answered. Layla's, um, but I think it might've been answered. Can you speak to some of your experiences are perhaps reflective or connect to the systemic inequality inequities that are definitely part of Ebony and Ivy at colleges like Williams. I elaborated a little with that, Leila. <laughs> I mean, I think all we can make connections to all of these things. I think the the things that me and, and other um, marginalized um, students felt particularly my, my black peers were directly related to the fact that the, you know, the college was not founded for us, right? That long legacy wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a college for black folks and brown folks, wasn't a college for women, right? And, and I think that legacy is strong and, you know, hopefully it's changing, but, um, but I think that, um, part of why people like Williams is because it's elite, right? You feel special, like you're part of something. Um, and that very thing is bred off these systemic inequities. Um, and it, it makes it even harder for folks who are outside of that norm to feel connected to the college. Um, uh, so for me, you know, speaking from an I place, I, I wish that Williams cared more about women um, cared more about women of color, cared more about people who have, you know, diverse living arrangements and situations. And, you know, I remember when I had a child and I went and spoke to a dean, they're like, yeah, there's always been people with kids here, but they were men whose partners lived somewhere else. And, you know, it was a men's college. So, you know, they had no resources for that. And I was like, well, it's not a men's college anymore. So you would think that they had evolved and created more resources. So um, I think that we can connect many of these things. I think the experiences of my black peers not speaking on behalf of them, but as colleagues and friends, um, I think the anti-black racism at Williams was very extreme in my time. Um, and you, uh, you could see it amongst all folks of color as well. You, I know that the reason I joined the Black Student Union was because I felt that the Latinx organization was anti-Black. Um, so I think that those are difficult conversations we don't often want to have, <laughs> but there's a long legacy there. Um, Thank you. Let's try to fit one more question in. Um, so we touched a little bit about, about this. I think both, both of you, all of you have integrated um, Allison's question in. Um, Jackie, class of 75 asked, how can we continue these conversations um, and create the, more space for um, these wonderful conversations. I'm taking that into a different context, Jackie, but I think that was your intention. So we're having these conversations now. How do we move this forward um, about making 
really integrating these conversations about ebony and ivy, these conversations about um, anti-black anti-blackness, um, conversations about um, what's going on at Williams. How do we move forward? I totally appreciate the progressive, forward-thinking oriented nature of that question. And I think I have a question and a comment. The question is for the people who are in leadership roles at the college, I wonder how you're all going to move this forward, right? And those who aren't in leader, serving in leadership capacities. I also have a question about where's Professor, where's President um, Mandel, where's the provost, um, and also where where the people who are have you know who have the clutch on the pockets of this university of the college, um, right? So members of alumni fund, the people who have these money building campaigns. Um, when we're thinking about reparative work and equity and material conditions, it's really important to have all hands on deck and to have these leading positions um, in in people at at the at the conversation as well. And also, how are we going to communicate this information, not just to the leadership but to the wider part of the of the campus? Um, I, so I have more questions than I do answers. But in response to that. I hope we can move it forward with a concrete call, with a concrete plan, and with members of leadership and people who have the power within our campus community that includes alumni and students. Um, but I don't want to put the onus and labor on us because we know that we don't run this space in the same way that um, that other people in the hierarchical positions do, right? But we also know that we are we definitely have the, the the capacity and the power to be able to make demands in order to move this and agitate the space in the way that it should in order to make that change. So yeah, all angles and and what's the call? What's the action? What's the concrete? How are we building this momentum? I have I have questions. I love it. Um, well, we're at 1.01 p.m. Um, I believe we are saving the chat. So if there's more questions, um, I can forward them or Siobhan or um, Essence or Anthony, we can forward them on to the panelists. And that was a really great conversation. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for leading it and the panelists for being here. That was really fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>